Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Reformed Church at Indian Creek on the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. I welcome those uh, of our members as well as visiting today, both here in person and online. Uh, I do have a number of announcements uh, I want to share with you. Then I want to bring a, a quick update from our Four Seas Board of Director meetings, which took place uh, this past week in Central Florida. Uh, first of all, uh, the Youth Fellowship will be going to Light East tonight for a Super Bowl party at 6 p.m. Uh, Monday, the Finance Committee as well as Outreach Committees meet. Uh, this Tuesday is February 14th. Don't neglect your responsibilities, all right? <laughs> it's Valentine's Day. But the prayer shawl is also meeting. It's our Tuesday night ministry here at Christ Reform. We have our junior choir from 6 to 6.30. Uh, ladies Bible study, I blast, of course. Um, ladies Bible study also on Thursday and men's Bible study this coming Saturday. Uh, there's a few other uh, notes I need to make. One about the news de newsletter deadline forthcoming. If you haven't done so already, please pick up uh, your St. Valentine's Day themed newsletter for the month of February. It's on the welcome table for you, as well as an updated directory. Uh, I put this out on the welcome table. I see there's only a couple copies left. I have more, but there is a, a little booklet entitled How to Identify and Use Your Spiritual Gifts. Um, if you have never done a spiritual gifts survey before, I encourage you to do it. Um, you can do it with a, a, a trusted confidant or, or your spouse uh, to check your answers, to make sure you're answering truthfully. Um, and it's, it doesn't take too long, and it will help lead you or guide you into some areas of service in Christ church. Also, the upcoming Lenten devotional is available for you on the welcome table. There's an address change there for Bill and Dottie. I'll draw your attention to the prayers and concerns. You can read the rest of the rest of the announcements for yourself. I do want to just briefly report uh, on my time in Orlando. Uh, the board of directors for the Conservative Congregational Christian Conference uh, gathered once again. Uh, we gather in person twice a year. It's always in February in Florida, and it's in July, and it's uh, associated with our annual family gathering, uh, wherever that may be. Uh, this year, it's going to be in St. Cloud, Minnesota in July. Uh, we met on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It's always a, an encouraging time to get together with uh, the extended family, if you will. Um, we begin with a prayer meeting. That's always the way our conference, be our, our board of directors meetings begin on Monday night, uh, where we just go around the table and introduce uh, ourselves one to the other. There's always a, a new face or someone we haven't met before. And then we share and spend some time in uh, intercessory prayer with each other. Uh, Tuesday in earnest, the meetings kick off. The first thing we always do is... Uh, at a consistory meeting, I pass around a pastor's report. The way we do it at, at the board of directors meetings is we hear um, from all of our staff, from our conference minister, Ron Hamilton, uh, John Kimball gives a report on church uh, revitalization, redevelopment. Uh, we, we hear from the three Ps, conference care, as well as church multiplication. Uh, we hear from all our regional uh, pastors, uh, Tim DeBose, our regional pastor, and uh, he presents his report as well. It's just a very encouraging time to hear what God is doing uh, around the 4C family of churches across the United States. And uh, I just one quick story that comes to us from southwest Colorado about a little 4C church out there in a town of 800 um, that typically has 1,200 attendees on a Sunday morning. There's more people attending that church on a Sunday morning than live in the town. Obviously, they're drawing them in from the neighborhood. Um, but w what an encouragement to hear, hear that report, um, as well as what God is doing uh, in the hearts and minds of individuals, as well as individual congregations. Uh, we move from the reports. If you've ever been on a board or borough council or served on a consistory, it's the things that need to happen, that need to take place. We, we listen to correspondence. Um, we make um, decisions based upon budgeting, setting a budget, approving a budget. Uh, what else do we hear? 
uh, just all the day-to-day the -day operations that, that we only get to hear or, or meet together and, and discuss uh, twice a year. But uh, a couple of exciting things is we've really been looking at our annual gathering. Uh, the way we do it is we appoint ad hoc subcommittees that are given a task, they're assigned a specific task, and they meet in that six-month interim and report back to us. Um, we're looking at uh, kind of shaking things up with our annual gathering. Um, we uh, approved uh, uh, another position, another staff position for the four C's, and, and that's an annual gathering coordinator, It'll be kind of like an events planner. Uh, this person who's yet to be hired um, will take over the majority of the responsibilities of making that happen just because it's hard to find volunteers anymore. You know, that's true locally as well as uh, nationally. Um, so this is something we really wanted to uh, re-examine, reinvest in, um, kind of move it more to a professional type uh, meeting or conference, um, maybe looking at changing the time from the summer to the late fall. Um, those things are still up in the air. But uh, the, the most encouraging thing to me is just to be able to spend time with uh, brothers and sisters, fellow pastors uh, of Christ Church from around the globe. And I've developed, uh, I'm still trying to figure out, I've been on the board for 12 years. I think that's correct. I've been on the board of directors. I'm the longest serving member of the board of directors. Yeah, I'm a glutton for punishment. Um, but I, I, I goofed around for the first uh, few years. I will be paying my dues, uh, believe me, come this July, because um, that is one thing we discussed and is pretty much in stone, is my name's going to be put forward uh, to be the next president of the board of directors uh, of the four C's. And that transition, I'll go from vice president to president, Alvin Helms, who, who's currently uh, a dear friend and, and president of the board of directors, um, will be through his three-year cycle and cycle off come July. And um, unless the Lord has other plans, uh, and that's fine with me, uh, I, I'll be the next uh, the president of the board of directors. So that's just a brief um, update. I might have a story or two about an alligator and a golf ball. I can neither confirm nor deny publicly if that's true. But if you want to talk to me in a fellowship hall, I might have a story or two to share with you about that. I think that's everything. Is there anything else? I've been gone all week. Um, doesn't seem like it because, yeah, I was here last Sunday. We're all together again this Sunday. Anything uh, we need to mention? Draw your attention to the prayers and concerns, of course. If not, let's stand for today's call to worship. <laughs> Let all the land ring out with the sounds of praise to the Lord. Only those pure in heart and deed and without sin before the Lord. Yet in Christ we are all washed clean and called to worship God, our refuge and strength. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. A mighty fortress is our God. Hymn number 43.
Let us now confess our sins. Lord, so many times we have failed to remember that we are members of and heirs to your kingdom. Instead, we have acted though we live in our own little kingdoms and have focused on our own little worlds. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to reach out and share with a hurting world the love we receive by being your children. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, for we are sorry for all we have done to displease you. Bring us back to yourself. Forgive us by your unchanging mercy and fill us afresh. This we humbly ask in Christ's name and for his glory. Amen. Let it be done to you as you have believed. And I, by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, declare your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you in Jesus' name, and we come to you by our adoption. We thank you that you have chosen us in Christ Jesus, even before the foundations of this world were laid. Uh, you called us by name. Uh, you united us eternally through Jesus to yourself and to um, all the saints, um, all the saints that have come before us, the saints here and now at Christ Reformed Church and your church militant as well as um, your church victorious in heaven and those who are to follow. We just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to smile down upon uh, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Uh, we pray that you would use us uh, remind us uh, of why we are here, um, or here primarily, to give you our glory, to give you your glory, I should say. Um, and we do that, um, yes, corporately, gathered together, called out and gathered together here on Sunday morning, but also wherever it is that we go in this world, uh, remind us of our primary mission. Our mission uh, is the Great Commission, which is to make disciples. Um, that means more than converts or winning souls. Um, but it means uh, making followers of you. Uh, we thank you that this is your eternal plan for the ages. Uh, we thank you that we have a, a part and a role in fulfilling that great commission. And we pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use uh, us here at Indian Creek, uh, as well as uh, the 4C family of churches and, and all the other churches um, that confess who you are and what you have done. Uh, we pray for all of us um, that we would live up to that high calling, that we would be uh, shining stars in, in a darkened world, um, that when others look at us, they would see Jesus. Uh, I do want to pray specifically today for the 4C family of churches, Lord, um, as uh, we've all departed 
uh, from our time together. We thank you for that time that we had. Uh, we thank you for those strong relationships that bind us together. Uh, we thank you that um, we have the freedom, um, we have uh, the courage just to be able to share with each other, to uh, bear each other's burdens, uh, to lift each other up, uh, and also to conduct the business of, of your conference, the Four Cs, uh, around these United States. Uh, just pray, Lord, that you'll continue to use us as we focus on the three Ps, our three priorities of church multiplication, planting new churches, of church revitalization or redevelopment, and also conference care, caring for uh, whether pastors or, or churches that are hurting. I just pray, Lord, um, that as everyone travels home and returns to their respective parishes, uh, that you'll continue to use them there and be an encouragement uh, to your flock. Lord, we also want to pray this morning uh, for those in our own church family, extended church family. Uh, we think of Jim, uh, Brian's dad, uh, who's at rehab now. Uh, we just pray that he continues to uh, gain strength and, and recover from his long hospital stay. Uh, be with Brian uh, as well as the rest of the family. Uh, also want to pray for Ellen's sister, Gail, as she continues her battle against cancer. Just pray, Lord, that you comfort and encourage Gail and her husband and, and the entire family during this time. Uh, also want to pray for Carol as she fights uh, her battle against cancer. Be with husband Dave, son Tim as well during this difficult time. Just trust them to you. Also, Lord, want to lift up before your throne uh, of grace, uh, Loretta. Uh, she has uh, been in the hospital for a very long time. Uh, she's still waiting for tests. She needs tests in order to have a procedure, in order to do what needs to be done, and it is frustrating and discouraging. Uh, we just uh, trust her to you, as well as Michelle and, and the rest of the family, and just ask, Lord, um, that she would bear up under um, this, this distressing time. Um, encourage her, comfort her, pray that things just happen. Happen Monday, tomorrow, as they're supposed to. Uh, no more delays, uh, no more waiting, but we trust the Lord right to you. Uh, we also want to pray, Lord, uh, for Rihanna uh, for, and Mike as well um, over the recent passing of Rihanna's dad. I just pray that you comfort and encourage Mike and Rihanna at this time as well as the rest of the family, um, may we be uh, your ministering angels uh, to them as we comfort and encourage them during this season of loss. And uh, also, dear, dear Lord, we just pray, there's many, uh, unbeknownst to me, unbeknownst to others, uh, just requests for healing, uh, physically, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Uh, there's others who are still suffering loss of loved ones uh, there are those who just need encouragement. Uh, we just pray, Lord, uh, for those unbeknownst uh, prayer requests. Um, just lift them up before your throne of grace and ask that you be kind and merciful to your people. Um, be gracious towards us. Um, comfort us in our affliction. Uh, strengthen us in the midst of whatever trials we may be in. And remind us uh, uh, of who we belong to. Um, we are not belonging to ourselves. We belong to someone else, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and it's him who accomplishes everything necessary for our salvation, um, as well as uh, will always be with us to the end of the age. So we pray all these things in his precious name. Amen. Amen. Come, we that love the Lord. Hymn number 22.
the ushers would please come forward. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we do know that you own a, thousand, uh, a cattle on a thousand hills. Um, all the wealth of this world is really yours. Um, yet you have designated unto each of us a, a portion of that uh, to be stewards of. Help us to be good stewards of all your blessings, uh, financially and otherwise. Uh, may this act of worship as we return to you, just a small portion of what you blessed us with, be pleasing in your sight. Uh, Use these tithes and offerings to accomplish thy will on this earth. Amen. You may be seated. This time we'll hear from the senior choir as they bring us today's anthem, Never Let Us Go.
Deacon Eric Feiner will now share our scripture lessons for today. Eric? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, this morning's scripture readings can be found in your bulletin insert. The Old Testament reading uh, is from the book of Zechariah, chapter 1, verses 18 to 21. Then I looked up, and there before me were four horns. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these? He answered me, these are the horns that scatter Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I asked, what are these coming to do? He answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head. But the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. The epistle reading is from the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. The gospel reading is from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Very well done. As uh, many of you know, uh, my father was a carpenter. He worked for his father, who was also a carpenter, as well as uh, his two brothers, and uh, they were known back in the day as Melvin F. Nice and Sons. After my grandfather passed away, the boys broke up the business and they set out on their own. I got to spend a lot of time with my father on the job. From the mundane task as a little boy uh, of picking up the shingles and nails that uh, he had ripped off of a roof and just thrown to the ground below. I think I got hit by more than one flying shingle in my childhood. Um, we also carried those brand new shingles, you know, up step, or not step ladders, but up ladders, uh, usually two flights or two floors. Helped him put up trusses and walls and rip out cabinets and whatever it was uh, that he needed a helping hand with once uh, he struck out on his own. You know, my dad had a work uniform. I think Merle had the very same uniform, <laughs> right? Flannel shirt with bib overalls. <laughs> he wore bib overalls every day. And, and on those overalls, uh, right here at the hip was a loop. And that loop held the tool of his trade, uh, like uh, uh, a marshal or uh, a gunslinger from the Old West. And they would keep their peacemaker right there by their side. My dad always carried with him a hammer. Actually, this hammer. Um, this was always in his belt loop on the job. And, and as you know, hammers primarily have two functions. Um, hammers can break down, tear apart, you know, like an old shingled roof. It breaks or smashes as in cinder blocks or old cabinets. It can also build, you know, construct, put together as in trusses and walls or, or laying out new roofs. Any job, save new construction, requires a bit of both. A new addition, a new kitchen, a new bath, a new roof, first requires a certain amount of dismantling, you know, taking or breaking things down. Then, once that is accomplished, you are able to, to build upon, add to, or make new again. This is the task, literally and figuratively, that lay before Zechariah along with the 50,000 or so souls that returned to Jerusalem from their exile. The literal work 
was the rebuilding of the gates and the walls and the temple. And that required the tools of the trade, plumb lines, measuring lines, chisels and hammers. But there was something else that needed rebuilding. And that work was a spiritual work, a work that was individual as well as it was corporate. And like an old world's craftsman, God uses the tools of his trade to do a good work in his people. He uses his means to rebuild and to restore his people to a right or proper relationship with himself. But before we see this unfold in our passage for today, let's quickly review uh, what we have covered thus far. God is graciously offered to return to his people. If they return to him, i.e., if they confess their sins, uh, repent of their sins, he will forgive them of their sins and restore them to a right relationship. Just as the temple was the uh, dwelling place of God, God offers to dwell in his people's hearts by his Holy Spirit. God has promised that he will return to them. Remember, that was the theme of our first sermon, to build them up in godliness. He will bless them. He will make them prosperous, uh, the city and the people. In other words, he will physically bless them with success and prosperity as well as bless them with great spiritual prosperity, with, with great spiritual gain. Uh, as the angel had said, verse 17, my towns will again overflow with prosperity and the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. But in order for that to happen, in order for that to come to pass, the people needed assurance. They needed God's assurance that he would protect his people from all of their enemies, their enemies from without as well as their enemies from within. We pick up today with verses 18 and 19. Then I looked up, and there before me were four horns. I asked the angel who was speaking to me, what are these? He answered me, these are the horns that scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, the imagery here is, to be quite frank, a little bizarre, right? Uh, what kind of literature is this? I mentioned last week, we're dealing with a special genre, genre of literature known as apocalyptic, right? And there's prophecy, there's apocalypse. Prophecy is always to warn. Apocalypse is always to encourage. And they can come in words and they can come in visions. Um, this is a perplexing and, and, and bizarre image, but it's really easy to interpret. Uh, the horns, four horns in our case, are often represented of their metaphors for earthly kingdoms, dynasties, uh, earthly or, or uh, yeah, earthly rulers, powers. Uh, why? Well, horns long before they came from brass came from what? Yeah, animals, right? And what kind of animals? Powerful ones, right? Like the water buffalo, the rhinoceros, rams, steers, to name a few. So animal horns became associated, positively speaking, with power and strength. Negatively speaking, horns became associated with pride and arrogance. You know, we might remember Daniel's vision uh, from chapter 7 of his book when he sees horns as representing the nations that, that rose up or, or would rise up against God and his purposes. That, that vision represented the history of the world's empires that were and, and that were to come. These horns uh, may very well represent the kingdoms that set themselves up against God and his people. The kingdoms like Assyria, Babylon, the Medes and the Persians. You know, or more broadly stated, just God's enemies from the four corners of the earth, the north, the south, the east, the west, either fit well. But the point being is that the Jews would remember well that they were scattered, 
they were scattered. Now, they were scattered by whom? By the enemies of God's people, yes. But they were scattered because of their own rebellion and sin against God and his word, his prophets. As you may recall from our time in Esther, the reason Esther and Mordecai are in Susa, in the courts of the Persian Empire, is because of the disobedience and unfaithfulness of their forefathers. And God used his horn, his servant, Nebuchadnezzar, to bring his judgment down upon his own people for their sin. The lesson, unrepentant sin, sin that you do not deal with, always brings ruin. Therefore, there's a practical, practical application for the Christian today in these verses. As we return, as we repent, God promises that he will return unto us. He does that by showing us his mercy, by forgiving our sins, filling us with his spirit, uh, blessing and prospering his beloved adopted children. But all of that can come crashing down if we are overcome by any of our four great adversaries. And they come from all directions. They come from within and they come from without. And they are no other than sin, self, Satan, and the cosmos or, or the world. And this is the point made by the vision given to Zechariah. If it happened before, the people remembered it can happen again. Be alert. You know, be on guard. Uh, return to me. Abide with me. I will return to you. I will abide with you, says the Lord. You know, but turn from me. Return to your old ways. Turn towards the carnal desires of your own flesh, the enticements of this world, the subtle whispers of the evil one, and your sin and your folly will surely be your ruin. We have, like all of God's people, two options before us. Our way or his way. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. I asked, what are these coming to do? He answered, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could raise their head but the craftsmen have come to terrify them and throw down these horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter its people. Again, strange vision, but obvious meaning. Yes, there are these horns, these, these powers that defeated Israel in the north, Judah in the south, Jerusalem, and these not the same powers, but other earthly powers are terrifying Israel now. But God has his own craftsmen, four of them, whose hammers can terrify the horns and smash them to pieces. Although the, the, the dominant uh, theme of this chapter is the sovereignty of God, uh, it's all throughout the chapter. Nine times God is called the Lord of hosts. The horsemen, you know, you remember from last week, uh, in that first vision portrayed the name, the meaning of his name perfectly. He is the Lord of the mounted host of heaven. Uh, this second vision offers another expression of his might, uh, namely that God has the answer to every kind of threat that may arise against his people. Uh, the word craftsman speaks of you know, all kinds of artists. You think of carpenters and, and stonemasons and metal workers, but the emphasis is not on their skill so much as it on their destructive power you know, to tear down. This is the point that God is making to Zechariah as well as to us today. He can overthrow every enemy who threatens our salvation. And that's been true throughout all history. God has always provided what is needed to protect and to preserve a remnant, uh, a chosen people, you know, his church for himself. 
when there was great heresy, you know, like Arianism, he lifted up valiant teachers of the truth, such as St. Nicholas. When there was rampant persecution, he made the blood of the martyrs the seedbed of his church. And the same is true for you and me, you know, as individuals. The craftsmen of this vision remind us of what God has said through Jeremiah. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? God's word, the Bible, is our ever-sufficient weapon. It's our weapon in battle, both corporately as, as a church body and individually for every Christian. You know, like a, um, a nail head sticking up uh, out of a roof, it is capable of, of knocking down every upraised horn. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 10, for the weapons of our war warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy argu arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This same word, this same hammer of God that is so useful for, for building us up spiritually is equally useful in battle against our foes. Paul says in Ephesians, the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone. He's the one that holds it all together. He does that by his death and resurrection. Jesus stands as the chief witness to the grand master's building project, the plan of the Father. Jesus, the one who represents the perfect will of the Father, indicates that the Father's home is both for those who were near as well as those who were far off, for those who were once members of the covenant as well as those who have been separated from the covenant. His sacrifice is the ultimate testimony on which all of us can rest our claim on his love. He's the cornerstone of our assurance, a divine stone that cannot be shaken, a rock upon which the hope of all who trust in him is secure. Maybe now we understand the words of Isaiah describing the ministry of the coming Messiah. See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for a sure foundation. And the one who trusts will never be dismayed. The witnesses of the apostles and the prophets and the Lord Jesus Christ himself on our behalf are in the inspired foundation, the divine cornerstone of our assurance of his love. No matter the temporal struggles or transitions, the difficulties, the heartaches, the setbacks, any earthly trouble in this life uh, cannot prevail. The psalmist rightly mused, unless the Lord builds the house, the builder's labor is in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the Lord, I'm sorry, the guards stand watch in vain. As always, God does his work. He does his work. He keeps his word, he builds, he does that which no mortal could do. As Jesus said, I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, not Peter himself, but the object of the good confession of Peter, which is Jesus Christ himself, on this rock, I, who's doing the work? Who's doing the building? I will build my church, says Jesus, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Let me ask you, are you a part of God's grand building project? His one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Do you have the faith, the assurance that you belong as our beloved catechism states it, body and soul, life and death, not to yourselves, you are not your own but to your faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who at the cost of his own blood has fully paid for all of your sins and has freed you from the tyranny of the devil. 
what God's people needed then and what God's people need today is the same. We need assurance. That's confidence. It's the freedom from doubt. It's a God-given confidence for every true believer in Jesus Christ of their present approval that you stand right before God and your future acceptance by the Father based on the work of God the Son. I titled today's sermon, The Hammer of God. It's a good title, isn't it, given the context? But did you know there's a book entitled The Hammer of God? Yeah, it's by a Swedish Lutheran pastor and the bishop of the Swedish Lutheran church. His name uh, was, God rest his soul, uh, Bo Gertz. It's a fascinating read. I commend it to you. It, it's actually divided into to three sections or three novelettes um, about the same church, uh, the same country parish, um, but they take place in different decades. The first novelette is about 1810, uh, the second is 1870, and the last one is 1940. I only have it on Katerina's tablet, so I'm afraid I cannot offer it or lend it to you. But there is this fascinating exchange that takes place in the second novelette. Uh, it covers 1870. It's a conversation between an older senior pastor, he's called the rector, and the new, fresh-faced, newly minted grad from Stockholm, the curate. Uh, pastor Friedfeldt is the curate. He's the, the young um, pastor who's just experienced an awakening uh, during a recent revival. The curate, upon meeting the rector for the first time, says, I just want you to know from the beginning, sir, that I am a believer. He saw a gleam in the old man's eyes, which he could not interpret. Was approval indicated? Or did he have something up his sleeve? The rector put the lamp back on the table. He puffed at his pipe, and he looked at the young man a moment before he spoke. So, you're a believer. I'm glad to hear that. What do you believe in? The curate stared dumbfoundedly at his superior. Was he jesting with him? But sir, I am simply saying that I am a believer. Yes, I hear that, my boy. But what is it that you believe in? The curate was almost speechless. But don't you know, sir, what it means to be a believer? That is a word which can stand for things that differ greatly, my boy. I ask you only what you believe in. In Jesus, of course, raising his voice. I mean, I mean, that I have given him my heart. The older man's face became suddenly as solemn as the grave. Do you consider that something to give him? By this time, the curate was almost in tears. But sir, if you do not give your heart to Jesus, you cannot be saved. You are right, my boy. And it is just as true that if you think you are saved because you give Jesus your heart, you will not be saved. You see, my boy, he continued reassuringly, it is one thing to choose Jesus as one's Lord and Savior, to give him one's heart and commit oneself to him, and that he now accepts one into his little flock. It is a very different thing to believe in him as the redeemer of sinners of whom one is chief. One does not choose a redeemer for oneself, you understand 
nor give one's heart to him. The heart is a rusty old can on a junk heap, a fine birthday gift indeed. But a wonderful Lord passes by and has mercy on that wretched tin can, sticks his walking cane through it, and rescues it from the junk pile and takes it home to be with him. That is how it works. When the old man continued, his voice was gentler still. And now you must understand that these two ways of believing are like two different religions and they have nothing whatsoever to do with each other. Are we saved by grace through faith? And this is not of ourselves. Does God call us by name? Does he do everything, the calling, the giving, the work that is necessary for our salvation? What is it <laughs> that we believe? Or, state another way, what are we trusting in? Ourselves? Our own intellect? Our own volition or will? Our hearts? If that is the basis for our salvation, we will question our salvation the rest of our natural born days. But if our assurance, if our confidence is in the object of our faith, outside of ourselves, if it is the hammer of God, his promises, his declaration, his word, his son, his work and sacrifice, his redeeming, his electing, his calling, his choosing you, then you are standing on a rock that cannot be shaken. The trustworthy, irrevocable, and eternally standing word of God. Who is it? You believe it. The scripture says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And for the redeemed of the Lord, he will do his work. He will accomplish his purposes in and through us as we humbly submit ourselves to the blows of his hammer as he maybe at first tears us down in order to build us up to the praise of his glorious name. Amen. Would you please stand? Join me in our closing hymn for today, hymn number 694.
Receive now unto you the benediction from the Lord. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity amongst yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.